Okay, let's start our lecture today. Last week, we learned Laplace transform. On Wednesday, we introduced the definition of Laplace transform, which is an extension of Fourier transform from imaginary number j omega to the entire complex domain S. And then we learned how to calculate Laplace transform using standard definition, basically an integral. Uh, we practice uh, this procedure using some examples. And then on Friday, we learned uh, several properties of Laplace transform linearity, uh, which is quite similar to Fourier transform. But Laplace transform, we need always specify the region of convergence, ROC. For linearity, we had a vague statement that ROC contains the intersection of uh, uh, R1 and R2, where R1 and R2 are the ROCs of X and Y respectively. But in uh, specific examples, we can see that uh, both uh, scenarios can occur. Either the ROC equals R1 intersecting R2 or ROC strictly contains R1 intersecting R2, which need case by case discussion. And that kind of discussion usually depends on the Laplace function. Uh, the pole of the Laplace function. Say if we have two poles minus one, uh, minus two, then the ROC can be to the right of minus one, to the left of minus two, or being the stripe between minus two and minus one. Uh, exactly uh, which case is ROC it requires the uh, discussion of uh, whether the original signal is right-sided or left-sided or contains both. Okay, and then we look at examples where the Laplace transform may not exist because if the time domain signal has two parts and each part uh, has an ROC, but the two ROCs, uh, their intersection is amply set, then the Laplace transform does not exist. Otherwise, the intersection of the two ROCs is the ROC of the new Laplace transform. And then we learned a convolution property. Basically, if we have two signals of convolution in the time domain, and then their Laplace transform is just a multiplication of their respective Laplace transforms, the ROC of uh, the new signal, again, it contains R1 intersecting R2. And this property laid a foundation for the application of Laplace transform to the LTI system, which we will learn in this lecture. Okay. But today, let's continue the study of several properties of Laplace transform. The time shifting property. Uh, we have a uh, signal x of t whose Laplace transform is x of s, ROC is denoted by r. Uh, so r is a subregion or a subset in the complex domain. Then if we shift the signal x of t over time by t0 unit, so we obtain the new signal x t minus t0, its Laplace transform is the original Laplace transform capital X multiplies additional Exponent, uh, exponential uh, minus s t0, where t0 is the same as the amount that signal is shifted. And notice that after time shifting, the region of convergence of uh, Laplace transform does not change. It is still the R for the original signal. So this property is again, uh, very similar to the Fourier transform. I believe it's not hard to understand. Uh, let's just practice using this example. Uh, I will give you two minutes.
Uh, I know a lot of you uh, care about the in-class test on Friday. I, I promise uh, later in today's lecture, I will give a briefing. Okay, let's look at the solution to this example. So first let's calculate the Laplace transform just using the definition uh, x of t exponential minus st dt, uh, taking the integral for t from minus infinity to plus infinity. But x of t, notice that it contains u of t minus two which is a step signal that takes value one after t uh, larger than two. So the integration uh, interval can be shrinked to two plus, uh, from two to plus infinity because the rest of the uh, region, the integral is just zero. And then on this region, two to plus infinity, we can just replace x of t with exponential minus three t without concerning about the u. So we merge these two terms together, exponential minus s plus three t. When pulling it outside of the integral, we need additional uh, coefficient, uh, additional factor on the denominator. And taking the upper lower limit, on the numerator, notice that for t goes to plus infinity, the limit only exists when the real part of s is larger than minus three. In other words, when the real part of s plus three is positive, only in that case, when t goes to plus infinity, we can have the exponential goes to zero, which is a finite limit. And then in that case, the numerator is just the lower limit. So when t equals two, exponential minus two s plus six. Because a lower limit, there is a negative sign that cancels with a negative sign on the denominator. So this is a result. Region of convergence, again, uh, real part of s larger than minus three. And how to obtain the Laplace transform using the time shift property that we just learned? The signal x of t at the first glance does not have a structure that makes us think of time shifting, but we can transform it a little bit. We extract exponential minus six, which is a constant factor. What is left is exponential minus three times t minus two. So everywhere time t appears, it appears as t minus two. So which is a time shifted version of sub signal over t. We know from previous uh, examples that if you look at the original signal exponential minus three t u of t, then its Laplace transform is one over s plus three with region of convergence real part of s larger than minus three because this is a right side signal. But u of t is right side, so the region of convergence is on the right side of the pole. Now, if you look at this signal which is this part. So comparing this signal with the signal above, we are changing from t to t minus two everywhere t appears. So it's a time shifted version of the signal above. Then applying the time shift property. So let's flip back to the last slide. What is the time shift property? Just the Laplace transform multiplies additional exponential. 
So in this case, we shift it by two. So multiply by exponential minus two s. A region of convergence does not change. And then what is the Laplace transform of x? Don't forget there is additional coefficient exponential minus six. So exponential minus six multiplies the result on the line above. This is our result. Again, the region of convergence is the same as the original C. We can compare the results obtained using the two different methods. We get the same result, so it is correct. Well, it, which method is better? It depends on your uh, preference. Usually the first method that comes up to your mind is the better method for you. So this is time shift property. There is also time scaling operation of the signal x of t, uh, after which the change of Laplace transform follows certain pattern. We look at this time scaling property. X of t is Laplace transform is capital X of s, region of convergence, again, we denote it by r. Then if we scale x of t by a factor a, so we get x of a t, then it's Laplace transform takes this form. So one divided by a absolute value because a can be negative or positive real number. And then s divided by a. This is again very similar to the Fourier transform. In Fourier transform, we have x of j omega divided by a multiplies one divided a absolute value. If you check the slides of the last chapter. But one thing which is a little bit harder to understand is the region of convergence. How does the ROC change? Here I write the new ROC as A times R. So how to understand A times R? Uh, later we will show it with examples. And as a special case of the time scaling property, when A takes value minus one, so X of minus T, which is the time reflection of X of T, mirroring x of t with respect to the vertical axis. Then applying the formula above, one divided by one absolute value, which is still one, then s divided by minus one, we have minus s. So x of minus t is Laplace transform is capital X minus s. And ROC also follows the same rule. When a is minus one, ROC is minus r. Again, we will explain the meaning of x, uh, the meaning of minus r using an example below. So let's apply time scaling property to obtain the Laplace transform of two signals. Here. And we already know that for a signal exponential minus t u of t, it's a right side signal. So Laplace transform is one divided by s plus one. Again. Let me remind you that when we have minus one t here, then it is s plus one. So there is a difference of the sign. And the region of convergence, because it's a right side signal region of convergence, is to the right of the pole. We denote it by ROC1. And the pole s equals minus one is what makes the denominator zero. So it's minus one. With this result, can we obtain the Laplace transform of these two signals applying this time scaling property. So try to do it yourself. I haven't explained what is the meaning of AR, but try to imagine it uh, with your own understanding. Later, I will review the answer.
I believe the function of the Laplace transform should not be difficult to obtain just by applying this property. But the region of convergence is something that needs uh, deeper understanding. So let's look at the result. So exponential minus 2t u of 2t, which is just a scaling of the signal above by a equals 2. So applying the formula 1 divided by 2 absolute value s divided by 2. Right, so just change the s here by 2 s divided by 2. Then it's 1 divided by s plus 2. Region of convergence, OK. The ROC2 for this signal, for this new signal, should be two times ROC1. ROC1 is the ROC for the original signal, right? Because it's AR, here A equals two, so two times ROC. So how to understand two times ROC1 in this case? ROC1 is plotted in this way. Is the part, is the uh, part of the complex plane with real part of S larger than minus one by two times it is still on the right of the pole, but the pole is changed from minus one to minus two. So here two times ROC1 means we multiply the pole by two. So we change it from minus one to minus two, but direction of the region of convergence does not change. It's still right side of the pole. But let's look at the next example, exponential 2t u of minus 2t, which is a scaling of the signal above by a equals minus two. Again, we can apply the formula to obtain the Laplace transform function as divided by minus two, minus two of a slow value here. So after some simplification, it's one divided by is minus two with additional minus sign at the beginning. Its region of convergence is ROC3, which should be minus two times ROC1. So because in ROC1, the boundary point is minus one, when it multiplies minus two, minus one times minus two, the result is two. So the new boundary point should be two, but also, when the ROC1 is multiplied with a negative number, the sign, the inequality sign need to be flipped. Originally it is larger than, which, is, which means the region of convergence is to the right of the pole. But after multiplying the negative number A equals ne negative two, the larger than need to be changed to less than. In other words, the region of convergence should be changed from right side to the left side. So this is one thing that we need to pay attention to. So ROC equals A times R, when A is negative number, then the direction of the convergence, region of convergence may also be changed. And this is reasonable because if you look at the transfer, the, sorry, look at the function of the Laplace transform, what makes the denominator equal zero is s equals two. And that's also s equals two is the boundary point, it's the pole. And if we look at this signal, u of minus two t, we know that it is to the left, it's a left side signal. Then the region of convergence should also be left side, uh, which is consistent with the, the laws that were observed from previous examples. This is a time scaling with a positive number and a negative number. And the results above can be checked using the alternative method. One thing we observe is that the signal u of 2t, which is time scaling of u of t, actually looks the same as u of t because both u of 2t and u of t has the structure that takes value zero when t is negative, takes value one when t is positive. So the signal exponential minus 2t u of 2t equals exponential minus 2t u of t. For exponential minus 2t u of t, we've calculated its Fourier transform using previous example. 
is just one divided by s plus two with the real part of s larger than minus two because u of t right side. So the region convergence also right side. This is the same as what we obtained on the last page of slide. And similarly, u of minus two t takes value zero when t is positive and takes value one when t is negative. So it equals u of minus t. For exponential 2t u of minus t, we've also done this example before. This region, so applying this previous result on the second line, this Laplace transform is just minus sign one divided by s minus two. We have minus sign here because on the left-hand side, there's no minus sign. In the previous result, when the left-hand side has minus sign, and the right-hand side does not have minus sign. And the region of convergence is left side, which means less than the pole. Again, it's the same as the ROC3 obtained on the last page. So the same results can be validated also using previous result. This is the time scaling property. Now let's look at a special case of time scaling, which is the time reflection. Again, we had this previous result, exponential minus t u of t, region of convergence, right side larger than minus one. What is the Fourier transform of exponential t u of minus t? It's just the, the time reflection of the signal above. So for this, I'll just show you the result. Applying this special case of time scaling property, this time reflection property, when this signal is the time reflection of the signal above. We just change s to minus s. And the region of convergence is minus r. So r is the region of convergence for the original signal. In our case, r is the ROC1. Then the region of convergence for the signal below should be minus ROC1. So we know that minus ROC1, first we need to change from, change the boundary point from minus one to one. Second, we need to flip the direction so it changes from right side to left side. And for this time reflection example, we can see that the ROC of the new signal is just the time reflection of the ROC1 of the original signal. So in other words, minus R denotes the reflection of R with respect to the vertical axis. It's just like measuring the region of convergence against the vertical axis, the imaginary axis. This is time reflection property. The next set of properties we will learn is the differentiation and integration. For differentiation, in Laplace, in Fourier transform, we learned that there are properties associated with both differentiation over T and differentiation over omega. And the same for Fourier transform, uh, for, for Laplace transform. Uh, we have signal X of T, whose Laplace transform is capital X, ROC is denoted by R. Then for the signal DX DT, its Laplace transform is original capital X multiplies additional S. I recall that in Fourier transform, it's J omega times X of J omega. Here we are just extending from J omega to S. And the ROC can be the same as R or it can be larger than R. So it can contain R. This is a weak statement. Again, this discussion case by case. And if we take the derivative of the Laplace transform function, so D capital X DS, then it is the Laplace transform of the signal minus t times x of t, which is again very similar to the Fourier transform because in last chapter we learned, learned when we take dx j omega, d j omega, then it corresponds to the Fourier transform of minus t x of t. So you can check the slide from the last chapter. For the S domain differentiation, the ROC does not change. So it's still the R for the original signal. So this two set of 
uh, equations. Now let's look at example, which can validate the differentiation property in time domain. We've learned that for a unit impulse signal, delta of t, its Laplace transform is just a constant value one for the entire complex domain S. Then in this example, what we want to determine is the Laplace transform for the unit step signal, U of T. And the relationship between U and delta, we've learned it before, DU DT is delta, and the integration of delta is u. And often it is not uh, uh, straightforward to obtain the Laplace transform by directly applying the differentiation property because the statement of its ROC is vague. It just says contains R. It's not a, a deterministic statement. Therefore, in this example, what I suggest is First, try to calculate the Laplace transform of U, specify its ROC using the definition of a Laplace transform, just using the standard integral, and, and determine, the, uh, determine the ROC according to the pole of the Laplace function. Then, from the result, try to validate the differentiation property we learned in the red box. So, Let's have uh, two minutes for practice, and then I'll show the result. Okay, so let's calculate the Laplace transform using the definition u of t exponential minus st dt taking integral over minus infinity to plus infinity. We eliminate u of t, which is one on uh, the region where t is positive. So we only take the integral from zero to plus infinity, exponential minus t, dt, because on this region u of t is just one. On the other region, u of t is zero, so we can just drop it off. So, uh, so calculate this integration, we need to put the minus s, the coefficient on the denominator, on the numerator, taking the difference between plus infinity and zero. For zero, exponential minus s times zero is just one, which is simple. For plus infinity, the limit only exists if the real part of S is positive. So real part of S is positive. In this case, exponential minus ST equals, uh, goes to zero when T goes to plus infinity. So zero minus one minus S, we have one divided by S, which is the result. And the region of convergence is uh, real part of S larger than zero. And this region of convergence also avoids the case where the denominator is zero. So we can put it on the denominator without any problem. Now let's validate the differentiation property from this result. So we know that delta is du dt. 
So dx dt is Laplace transform is S times capital X. Delta is du dt, so it's the Laplace transform of delta is S times one divided by S, which is one. This is consistent with the differentiation property. And in terms of ROC, the ROC of U is just the positive part of the complex plane. But the ROC of its differentiation is for all the S. This is consistent with the statement that ROC contains R, right? All the S, the ROC above contains the ROC below. So in this particular example, the ROC above strictly contains the ROC below. It is larger than the ROC below. Let's look at another example, which is for the differentiation in the S domain. We know from previous examples that when we have signal at zero of t, which is exponential minus three t of t, is Laplace transform is one divided by S plus three, region of convergence, it's a right side signal, so it's larger than the pole minus three. Then what is the Laplace transform of the signal multiplies t, we can apply the S domain differentiation property. And the key to this solution lies in the differentiation of the original x0 of s. So try to practice yourself in one minute. So we just take the derivative over S for the right-hand side. So the derivative of one divided by S plus three is minus sign one divided by S plus three squared. But this expression is for the Laplace transform of minus T times the original signal X zero of T, right? Because look at here, minus T. And what we want to obtain is the t times exponential minus three t of t. So the minor sign needs to be moved to the right hand side, which cancels the minor sign with the derivative it already has. So the result is plus one divided by s plus three squared. This is the result. And the region of convergence it's the same as the original signal. So real part of S larger than minus three. And we can check the result by calculating the Laplace transform of the same signal using the definition. So integration from minus infinity to plus infinity, signal T times exponential times U of T exponential minus S T dt, we can eliminate u of t by shrinking the integration interval to zero plus infinity, just the standard technique. And then t times exponential minus s plus three t dt. Here, uh, let's refer to this further explanation. So to calculate this integration, we first extract the coefficient as minus s plus three on the denominator so that we can change exponential minus s plus three t dt to d exponential minus s plus three t. Notice that 
to this point, the integration is still over time variable t. We are not changing the time variable, so there's no need to change the uh, limit of integration. But for this, for the integration taking this particular form, we can apply the integration by part. The first part is the multiplication of these two functions of t, t times exponential, taking the difference between lower upper limit. The second part is the integration over the same interval, but the original signal that's after the derivative is now released in front of the derivative. And the t here is, goes with the derivative, so it becomes dt. This is the integration by part. Now com coming back to the to this uh, box, so minus one divided by s plus three, the first part, plus one divided by s plus three. It's plus because there are two negative signs here. Two negative signs lead to plus the integration dt. Now for the first term, when the real, only when the real part of s is larger than three, we can have a finite limit when t goes to plus infinity. That limit is zero. And the second, the lower, the lower bound when t equals zero, we have zero times exponential zero. The answer is also zero. So the first term basically it is zero. And the second term, we know how to calculate an integration like this. Extract additional coefficient s plus three on the denominator, taking the difference between plus infinity and zero. Again, the limit only exists when the real part of s is larger than minus three. In that case, the limit is zero for when t equals when t goes to plus infinity. What is left is when t takes zero, the numerator is one. So one divided by s plus three square, which is the same result as what we obtained using the differentiation property. Again, when you are doing your homework or exam, you can choose either method. You can either use the property or you can use the uh, definition, whichever is convenient for yourself. And if you look at the result, uh, sorry, sorry for this, this slide should, should not appear here. If you look at the result from the last example, t times exponential signal times u of t to Laplace transform is s plus three square. And we can get a more generalized result by induction. So we can take dds to the right hand side and the Laplace transform for the Laplace transform to hold for the on the left hand side, we just multiply additional minus t. And the result is following. So if you have signal t to the power n minus one divided by n minus one factorial, exponential minus a t u of t, the so Laplace transform is one divided by s plus a to the power n. So we can check if n equals two. So n equals two is the right hand side is the uh, case above. Left hand side we have t to the power one, one factorial. So it's just a t times exponential minus a t u of t. So in the example above, a equals three. A region of convergence is to the right of the unique pole minus a. And reversing the integration property is the integration property. Uh, so x of t is Laplace transform is capital X, region of convergence is R. Then if you look at this signal, x of tau d tau from minus infinity to t. So after calculating this integration, the result only depends on the upper limit t. So the signal on the left hand side is a signal of t. This signal of t, if we take its Laplace transform, is capital X from above divided by s. 
a region of convergence, again, it's a weak statement. Just as the new region of convergence contains this region, right? R is the region of convergence of the original signal X of T, intersects the positive part of the complex plane, real part of S larger than zero. So we can check this integration property using the same example above. So delta of t, u of t, right? u of t is the integration of delta of t, uh, delta of tau from minus infinity to t. This is what we are familiar with. And then because of that, the Laplace transform function of u of t is the Laplace transform of delta divided by s, so one divided by s. So look at the region of convergence. So the, so let's first look at r intersecting real part of s larger than zero. In this example, r is the region of convergence of the signal above, which is all the s. And then it intersects real part of s larger than zero. The result is real part of s larger than zero because this is a smaller set. It's a subset of all the s. And the new ROC should contain this result. But in this particular example, this contains becomes equal. So the new ROC is exactly the R intersecting real part of s larger than zero. That's for this example. Again, this containing whether it is equal or strictly containing needs case by case discussion according to the pole of the Laplace transform function. Okay, let's have a break here. Uh, when we come back, we will continue study of Laplace transform, its application in continuous time LTI system, which is the last part of this chapter. Okay, let's resume the lecture. We've seen this uh, figure before. Uh, we have a linear time invariant system, LTI system in continuous time. Uh, its input signal is X of T, output signal Y of T equals the convolution of H of T and X of T, where H of T is the unit impulse response of the LTI system, which is the inherent property of the system itself. In last chapter, we learned that we can perform Fourier transform on both the input output of the LTI system. So X of J omega, Y of J omega, which is H times X. So in the frequency domain, the J omega domain, we can change the complicated convolution to the simple multiplication. And this is the same for the Laplace transform when we take the Laplace transform of both the input output of the LTI system, capital X of S, capital Y of S is capital H of S, capital X of S, where capital H of S is the Laplace transform of small h of t. And for the capital H of S, we give it a name, transfer function. So recall what was the H of J omega called in the last chapter. It was called the frequency response. So the transfer function is a generalization of the frequency response from J omega to S. And next, I will introduce to you a set of uh, properties associated with the transfer function H of S that can determine the property of the LTI system. So let's suppose H of S is a rational function of S. A rational function means a ratio between two polynomials of S. This is a common 
format of the Laplace transform of a function. Previously, we always see that for a Laplace transform, it has a polynomial on the numerator and denominator. Usually the order of the denominator polynomial is higher than that of the numerator. For that kind of a transfer function H of S, we look at its relationship with the LTI system property. So first, we learned in chapter two that if an LTI system, its unit impulse response H is zero for T negative. So when H T equals zero for T less than zero, then the LTI system is causal. So this property can be checked in the slides of for chapter two LTI system. And notice that when H of T equals zero for T less than zero, it means H of T only has may only have non-zero value on the right-hand side of the origin. In other words, this is the so-called right side signal in this chapter. And we've learned at the beginning when we introduced Laplace transform that when H of T is right side signal, then it's the region of convergence of its Laplace transform is to the right of the rightmost pole. So the Laplace transform of small h of t is capital H of S. Its region of convergence is right side. Because capital H of S may have multiple poles, then the ROC must be to the right of the rightmost pole. And all of these statements are equivalent with each other. Therefore, when H is a right side signal or when the ROC of H is right side, then the LTI system is causal. So here we learned an alternative method to judge whether LTI system is causal from its transfer function capital H of S. Previously, we can judge the causality property using the input output relationship, using the relationship between YT and X of t, or using the unit impulse response small h of t. And this chapter, we learned a third method using the structure of capital H of S. Right, if you have question about what is the rightmost pole, it will be clear when we look at an example later. Another observation is that, say, H of t, the unit impulse response, if we take its absolute value, then taking its integral over minus infinity to plus infinity. If this integral is finite, then from chapter two, we know that the LTI system is stable. And in this chapter, what we learn is that when this infinite integral is a, has a finite value, then the region of convergence of capital H of S contains the imaginary axis, real part of S equals zero or equivalently S equals J omega, which is the vertical axis in the complex plane. And if that happens, then the Fourier transform is well defined. In other words, the Fourier transform exists or the Fourier transform converges. And the region of convergence containing the imaginary axis and the existence of Fourier transform, they are equivalent to the finiteness of this integration, H of T of a solar value DT from minus infinity to plus infinity. And all of this equivalent statement tell us that the LTI system is stable. And there is a remark that for this equivalence to hold, there need to be other conditions which I didn't elaborate. But those conditions are generally hold in practice and they we assume that they always hold in, uh, in the scope of our class. So that's why these conditions are not mentioned. 
we can just take these statements as equivalent with each other. In particular, to judge whether an LTI system is stable, we also have an alternative criteria, whether the Fourier transform exists or whether the ROC contains the imaginary axis. So, let's look at an example to understand the knowledge on the slides above. We consider an LTI system whose unit impulse response is H of T. So far, what we only know about H of T is its Laplace transform function, capital H of S. It is called the transfer function of the LTI system. It is a rational function of S, which means both the numerator and denominator are polynomials of S. But here, we only specified the function of H of S. We didn't specify its region of convergence. Actually, depending on the possible different cases of region of convergence, H of T may have different representations. And the LTI system may have different properties. So I will elaborate below. So let's first look at this capital H of S, this rational function. And the first step is to use the partial fraction expansion to split it as the summation of two simple rational functions, where the denominator is only a first order polynomial. So it has, so the denominator as square plus S minus 12, if we factorize it as plus four, S minus three. So we divide as S plus four, S minus three, A and B are two constant coefficients associated with each term. And we multiply the factors again then on the numerator, we need to multiply A with F minus three, multiply B with S plus four. So that the coefficient before S is A plus B, the constant coefficient is four B minus three A. And this numerator needs to be the same as the original numerator S minus 10. So A plus one equals one, A plus B equals one, minus three A plus four B equals minus 10. Solving this set of uh, qualities, equations, we have A and B, which gives H of S written in the form of combinations of simple rational functions. This is the result by partial fraction expansion. I put the result here. So how is this result useful? We know that H of S is the Laplace transform of some signal H of T, but we haven't determined H of T till now because we learned at the beginning of this chapter that even different H of T can lead to the same expression of Laplace transform, right? If we go to this slide. So exponential minus a t u of t, it may have Laplace transform s plus a, one divided by s plus one, a. And this expression of x of t, which is different signal, it may also have Laplace transform of one divided by s plus a. Although for these two different time domain signals, the Laplace, tra the Laplace transforms have different ROCs. That is what we learned at the beginning this chapter. Now coming back to this case. So we need discussion across different regions of convergence. Case one, okay, H of S has two poles, minus four and three. Either pole can make the denominator zero. So our discussion is centered around these two poles. 
uh, the first case of region of convergence is to the left of the leftmost pole. Because there are two poles, the minus four is the so-called leftmost pole. And to the left of this leftmost pole, this case one, if ROC is in this region, then for the first term, two divided by S plus four, the ROC is to the left of it. And we know that the corresponding time domain signal should be a left side signal, should have U of minus T, exponential minus four T, because it's plus four, then exponential minus four. There is a different difference in the sign. Don't forget this additional minus sign. Only with this minus sign, we can keep this term positive, this term one divided by S plus four positive. And don't forget the coefficient two. This is the linearity property of the Laplace transform. And also in this same region of convergence, it is to the left of minus four, then it is also to the left of three. So for the second term, the region of convergence is also to the left of the pole. Therefore, the second term also corresponds to a left side signal, u of minus t, exponential 3t. Here, we don't have minus sign because minus sign is here. So the first term is plotted, it is a left side signal. It's only non-zero to the left of the origin. I plot, what I plot here is exponential minus 4t u of minus t. Exponential minus 4t is a function that decays as t increases. And the signal that plot on the right is exponential 3t u of minus t. Exponential 3t is a function that's increasing as t increases. But because of u minus t, the function is truncated and only the part to the left of the origin is retained. These are the structure of this first and second term of H of T. Okay. Now let's discuss the property of the LTI system. First, from what we learned in chapter two, we know that the LTI system is causal because it's not causal. Because for an LTI system is causal, it's H of T must be zero when t is less than zero. But here in our case, when t is less than zero, h of t is obviously non-zero. Therefore, the system is not causal. And also from the criteria we learned from chapter two, the LTI system is not stable because for the system to be stable, the integration of ht absolute value dt from minus infinity to plus infinity needs to be a finite value. But here, because of the first term, the first term as t goes to minus infinity, its absolute value goes to infinity. And the integration of this signal also takes an infinite value. It's not finite. Therefore, the LTI system is not stable. But we can also tell the causality and stability from the region of convergence of the Laplace transform. Because, so from this slide, we know that the system is causal when the region of convergence is to the right of the rightmost pole. In this example, the region of convergence is to the left of the leftmost pole, which does not satisfy the causality condition. Therefore, the system is not causal. And for the system to be stable, we can refer to the second property. For the system is to be stable, we need the region of convergence to contain the imaginary axis. But here, the region of convergence does not contain the imaginary axis. So the system is not stable. In other words, we can tell causality and stability of the system using either the function h of t itself 
or using the region of convergence of its Laplace transform. And they should lead to the same result. It should lead to the consistent result. And one thing to pay attention to is that for this case, the Fourier transform does not exist because Fourier transform exists when the region of convergence covers the imaginary axis, which is not the case here. So the Fourier transform does not exist. And again, this is consistent with our previous result. When the Fourier transform does not exist, the system is not stable. So a question from the chat window, there is no inverse Laplace transform. Well, we can define inverse Laplace transform uh, in a certain way, but uh, in this uh, course, I would prefer not to introduce inverse Laplace transform uh, because uh, the discussion of uh, different region convergence, uh, I believe it is more straightforward and the more precise way to determine small h of t. This is just the first case when the region of convergence is to the left of the leftmost pole. And the second case, H of S still has the same expression. H of S does not change. So it's poles minus four and three does not change. What changes the region of convergence? Now for the second case, region of convergence is between minus four and three. It's a stripe in between. And for this case, if you look at the first term, two divided by s plus four, for this term, the region of convergence is to the right of the pole. The pole is minus four, the region of convergence is to the right of it. So it should correspond to a right side signal. Right side signal u of t exponential minus four t multiplies the coefficient two. I plot it, it is on the right side of the origin, it's decaying because it's exponential minus 40. For the second term, one divided by s minus three, the region of convergence is to the left, right? Region of convergence is to the left of the pole three. So the corresponding time domain signal should be a left side signal. It should be u of minus t exponential three t. Again, there is no minus sign because minus sign is already here and the plot it is the same as the plot on the last figure for the second term. It's left side, which is increasing as T increases. But overall the H of T here is different from the H of T in case one, because in case one, both terms are left side. In case two, the first term is right side. The second term is left side. Now let's discuss the causality stability of the LTI system for case two, it is still not causal because of the existence of the second term. When t is less than zero, h of t is non-zero. So from chapter two, we know that the system is not causal. But the system is stable because if we take the integral of h of t of a slow value, for both the part where t is negative and the part that t is positive, H of T has a structure that as T goes to minus plus infinity, H of T goes to zero. And the integration, which is the area covered by the curve is a finite number. So because this integration is finite, the LTI system is stable. Again, a criteria we learned from chapter two. And we can tell the causality stability from the region of convergence. Again, let's recall this property. When the ROC is to the right of the rightmost pole, then system is causal. When the ROC contains imaginary axis, the system is stable. Now let's see whether it holds for the Laplace transform in case two. First, the ROC is a stripe in between. It is not to the right of the rightmost pole. Right, because the rightmost pole is three, it's not to the right of three. So it's not causal, it's not causal. But the ROC does contain the imaginary axis, in which case the Fourier transform exists and this
satisfies the condition for stability so the system is stable. Again, we can tell causality stability from H of T or from the region of convergence of Laplace transform. The results should be the same. And this Fourier transform just replaces S with J omega. So the Fourier transform of the same H of T. Now in a similar manner, we can discuss case three, where the region of convergence is to the right of the rightmost pole three. But in this case, both the first and second term should correspond to right side signal because the region of convergence is to the right of the corresponding pole. And the first term, the right side signal, u of exponential minus four t u of t, the second term, exponential three t u of t. So both terms are right side signals because of u of t. The system is causal because h of t, after combining these two terms, is still a right side signal, which means h of t is zero when t is less than zero. It satisfies causality criteria we learned in chapter two. But it is not stable. Although the first term, as t goes to infinity, the first term itself goes to zero, its integration goes to zero, uh, goes to a finite number. But the second term, as t goes to positive infinity, exponential three t u of t goes to infinity. And if we combine these two terms, taking the integral of h of t absolute value, as t goes to infinity, this integral goes to infinity, which is not a finite number and therefore the system is not stable. And in the same way, we can judge causality stability from the region of convergence. The region of convergence is to the right or the rightmost pole, which is exactly the criteria for causality. So the system is causal. But the region of convergence does not cover the imaginary axis. So Fourier transform does not exist and the system is not stable. Now we've together gone through the first example, which is very complicated. This actually needs, I, I, I think it needs some time for you to understand after class. It is the most difficult part of this chapter, I believe. But let's look at another example. Consider a continuous time LTIC. By the way, this example is from the exercise problem says two posted on Blackboard. Uh, I extracted it to the lecture because it has a particularly interesting uh, uh, representation of differential equations. Consider a continuous time LTI system. The input output of this system can be related by the following differential equation. So it contains the derivative of output y up to the second order and the uh, for the input it just x of t itself. There's no derivative. Let capital X and capital Y denote the Laplace transform of small x and y respectively. And h of s denote the Laplace transform of small h of t, the unit impulse response of LTI. So h of s is the so-called transfer function of the LTI system. And our first question is, what is cap h of s? So determine the function for h of s. Again, corresponding to that function of h of s, there can be different ROCs. And each different ROC corresponds to a different H of T. And each different ROC also corresponds to different property of the LTI system, which is the same as the last example. But our first task is to determine H of S. And to determine H of S, there are two piece of knowledge, two pieces of knowledge that can be useful. The first is this figure we've seen for the LTI system. The second is the time derivative, prop, time differentiation property of 
Laplace transform. So try to determine h of s from this differential equation by yourself. Let's look at the answer in two minutes. In one minute, actually, it should be easy. Okay, so we just take the Laplace transform of the differential equation. We know that, so X is Laplace transform is capital X, Y, capital Y, dy dt applying this uh, uh, differentiation property is S times capital Y, then d square Y dt square, just multiply additional S, S square. And h of s from this figure above, h of s is y divided by x. So from this polynomial, from this uh, equation of y, uh, this equation of s, we divide y, we divide x to the left hand side and divide the common factor in front of y to the right hand side. What we get is a polynomial on the denominator, s square minus s minus two on the denominator. So this h of s is again a rational function of s. This is h of s. To determine small h of t from h of s, we are gonna apply the partial fraction uh, expansion technique. Here I skip the intermediate process just to show the result. So s square minus s minus two, we can factorize it as s plus one times s minus two and split as two terms, one divided by s minus two minus one divided by s plus one, the coefficient is one over three. This is h of s written in the split form. Now let's discuss the small h of t according to different ROCs and the different properties of the LTI system. The h of s has two poles, minus one and two. So our discussion is again centered around these two poles. For case A, we consider the case where the region of convergence is between the two poles. It is the stripe between the two poles from minus one to two. In this case, corresponding to the first term, the region of convergence is to the left. Of it. So it should correspond to a left side signal, U of minus T exponential 2t. Don't forget this coefficient one over three and don't forget this minus sign. For the second term, the region of convergence is to the right of the pole minus one. So it should be a right side signal u of t exponential minus t coefficient one over three. And the system is stable. Because again, that we can we can tell whether the system is stable from the h of t or from the region of convergence, and from region of convergence is actually simpler, because this region of convergence ranges from minus one to two, so it crosses the imaginary axis, real part of s equals zero. And for this case. We know that when region convergence contains imaginary, imaginary axis, the system is stable. Okay, case two, the region of convergence is to the right of the rightmost pole. In this case, the rightmost pole is two. Then for both the first term and the second term, the region of convergence is to the right of the corresponding pole. Then both the first and second term should correspond to a right side signal. For the first term is exponential two t u of t, for the second term is exponential minus t u of t. Don't forget the coefficient one divided by three. And since h of t is right side, 
which means it's zero when T is negative, then the system is causal. Or since the region of convergence is to the right of the rightmost pole, we can tell that system is causal. And the last case is when the region of convergence is to the left of the leftmost pole. In that case, both the first and second term correspond to a left side signal. So both terms have U of minus T, exponential 2T, exponential minus T. Coefficient one over three and the negative sign. So when the Laplace transform is positive, then the negative sign comes with the time domain uh, signal. When the Laplace transform has a negative sign, then the time domain signal is plus. Uh, for the left side signal case, there's already always an additional negative sign in front of the, of the signal. And for this case, the system is not stable because the region of convergence is to the left. Remember that for the system to be stable, the region of convergence should be to the right. Therefore, the system is not stable in this case. The system is not causal because for the system to be causal, the region of convergence should contain the imaginary axis. But real part of S to the left and minus one, obviously does not contain the imaginary axis. So the system is not causal. In this case, telling whether the system is stable or causal from the region of convergence is simpler by looking at the structure of H of T. So now let me summarize the entire chapter. This chapter we learned Laplace transform, which is an extension of the continuous time Fourier transform we learned last chapter. It's extension from the frequency omega, from J omega to a complex number S. It all, S not only contains imaginary part J omega, but also contains a real part sigma that is possibly non-zero. Therefore extend the uh, Fourier transform on the imaginary axis to Laplace transform on the entire complex plane. And this extension called the Laplace transform applies when the Fourier transform does not convert. We motivated the study of Laplace transform at the beginning using example where the Fourier transform does not converge. And for Laplace transform, we not only need to write the function of S, but also need to specify the region of convergence. We always need to do that. We learned a set of properties associated with Laplace transform. And those set of properties also hold for the Fourier transform as a special case. Linearity, time scaling, time reflection, time shifting. So time reflection is a special case of time scaling when the scaling factor A equals minus one. We learned Differentiate differentiation property for differentiation in both time and S domain. The integration property, which reverses the differentiation property and the most important the convolution property. You have two signals convolution uh, in the time domain, then in the Laplace domain, in the S domain, they are the regular multiplication. And this convolution property can be applied to LTI system. So LTI system, given its unit impulse response, small h of t, we call its Laplace transform, capital H of S, the transfer function. And what we learned from the last two examples is that even with the same expression of transfer function h of S, if it has different region of convergence, then it corresponds to different unit impulse h of response, h of t, and different causality and the stability properties of the LTI system, which need a discussion in this way. A discussion of ROCs across different cases and the number of cases depend, depends on the number of poles of H of S. This finishes the, uh, the entire chapter, Laplace transform. So next Wednesday, we will start the new chapter, also the last chapter of this course, 
the Z transform, but this Friday we will have a uh, in-class test which examines the set of knowledge you learned in the previous a few weeks. So let's take this time to have a briefing for the in-class test. Friday uh, from 9.40 to 11, there is no tutorial on that day. This test, same as test one, will account for 10% of your final grade. It's open book, open notes. You can use your lecture slides, homework, sets, and solutions. You can write your own cheat sheet, which I believe would be useful. The important properties, formulas, and so on, if we write them down, it would be more efficient than find, searching for them in a lot of slides and notes. notes. But there is no discussion, no communication among students allowed, no web browsing except Blackboard, uh, no computation software needed. Basically, you need and you can calculate the answers to all the questions just by hand. So the scope of coverage continuous time Fourier transform, there will be one problem. The Fourier transform applied to continuous time LTI system, there will be one problem. So the first two problems are from last chapter, uh, from, the, uh, from chapter four. And then discrete time Fourier transform. So we learned discrete time Fourier transform in a short chapter, chapter five, there will be one problem. It will be just the calculation using the definition. And then Laplace transform, there will be one problem. It will be a calculation using the definition. I believe what you learned today about the properties about the LTI system, you need more time uh, to be trained and get familiar with them. So what we learned this lecture will not be uh, tested. And the difficulty of these problems will be the same, will be similar to your homework problems, not be much, will not be much harder. Uh, right. Uh, in other words, the problem one, three and four, uh, it will be enough for you to use the calculate, to use the definition to solve these problems. Although sometimes you would find that using some properties might be uh, more convenient, but it's not mandatory to use properties. You can always use definition if you prefer. And the second problem associated with the LTI system, we had standard examples for that kind of problems in the Fourier transform chapter. So make sure that you review that part of material. Yeah, the calculation will be a little bit tedious, but uh, uh, I'll try to make the problem at the reasonable uh, complications so that all the calculation can be complete, complicated in one now. Uh, again, you need two devices. Device A, usually laptop, is what you use to read the exam paper on Blackboard. Uh, so last exam, we find that a lot of students log in the Zoom using more than one devices, which uh, makes the management and the modulation more complicated. So try not logging Zoom with device A, uh, only logging Zoom with your device B that has a camera. It can be a phone or iPad or tablet. Make sure that you join Zoom with video for the imagination. The Zoom meeting will use our regular Friday lecture link. Make sure you join with your real name so we know that you are you. And uh, from 9.30 to 10, it is time for you to join the meeting for the ventilators to check attendance. And you can adjust your camera so you are at the best position. And we will again send the invitation to dispatch you to a breakout room for convenience of imagination. So when you see that imitation on your phone, uh, accept it. 
the exam will start at 10 a.m. sharp. Uh, at that time, assignment with PDF exam paper will become available on the Blackboard. And you need to make sure that you stay on the camera for at least 15 minutes. Only after 10.50, you can leave Zoom so that your device B camera is freed up for taking the photos with your answer paper and upload to Blackboard. So you have 10 minutes to upload answers. You can simply take photos and upload. And the exam will ends at 11 a.m. sharp. Late submission is not accepted. And yeah, I understand that you may occasionally get offline during the exam, but if your time on the video is less than 45 minutes, then half of your points will be subtracted. If you are absent from the video for more than 15 minutes, in other words, if you are on the video for less than 35 minutes, then basically we will, you will be deemed as under a non evangelated status and you will get zero point for this exam. So at 10 a.m., you will see in class test two in your blackboard. If you didn't see it, try to refresh your web page. So it will appear here. Currently, it is hidden from you. It will appear 10 a.m. on Friday. Uh, you have seen this figure before. I will not repeat. So just uh, make sure that your, yeah, you, 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 you appear on the video in this way. Uh, invitation to breakout room looks like this. Accept it when you receive it. Uh, this time I will just randomly dispatch because last time I tried to assign uh, students with particular ID to particular room, which is uh, very, uh, which is not very efficient. This time I just randomly assign. So we will receive the invitation very quickly before the exam starts. Again, I leave the uh, emergency contact uh, Look at which uh, region of your ID falls in, uh, uh, contacts the corresponding person if you have uh, an emergency problem, such as uh, cannot connect you online and so on. OK. Uh, this is the end of this lecture. Uh, good luck with your Friday test. See you on the next Wednesday lecture. Okay. Thank you.